call committee back to back to order. Uh, welcome to our meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations. I would like to ask all committee members to introduce themselves for the record, starting with Mr. Nakamayak. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome, Herb Nakamayak from Nanakpu. RJ Simpson, MLA Hay River, North. Michael Natalie, MLA for Dexel. Danny McNeely, Satu uh, Legion. Good morning. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. And I'm uh, Kieran Tester, a member for Cam Lake and chair of the Standing Committee on Government Operations. With me today as well are uh, committee researcher Alicia Tumshwix and uh, committee clerk Michael Ball. And we're also joined by the law clerk, uh, Sheila uh, McPherson. Uh, today, the Standing Committee on Government Operations will be holding a public hearing on Bill 15, an act to amend the, income ta uh, the Tobacco Tax Act, and Bill 17, an act to amend the Income Tax Act. Copies of the bill are available at the back of the room, uh, and we will start with Bill 15 and then consider Bill uh, 17 at uh, 11 o'clock. I would like to thank the Honorable Robert C. McLeod and his officials for being here today. Minister McLeod, you can introduce yourself and your staff uh, for the record and proceed with any opening comments for Bill 15. Minister yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, to committee. Uh, we are here this morning to discuss Bill 15, an act to amend the Tobacco Tax Act. With me today is Mr. David Sturt, uh, Deputy Minister, Department of Finance. Uh, Mr. James Cui is our Controller General, uh, Department of Finance, and Mr. Mike Reddy, Director of Legislation Division, Department of Justice. Also here is Mr. Terence Coutre, uh, Director, Shared, Director of Shared Corporate Services, Department of Finance, and Ms. Caroline Horn, Manager of Tax Administration. And uh, with the Department of Finance, and Mr. Robert Collinson, my Ministerial Special Advisor. Legislation is required to amend the Tobacco Tax Act to allow changes to the tobacco tax collection system to establish a provincial tax duty stamp to be placed on tobacco products sold in the NWT and to eliminate the commission paid to, to tobacco tax collectors. The establishment of a provincial tobacco tax duty stamp will require that all tobacco products sold in the NWT be marked, stamped, sealed, or labeled with a jurisdictional tax stamp. If the amendments are approved, retailers other than the two stores on reserve in the NWT found to be selling tobacco products marked with the federal excise stamp or referred to as black stock tobacco will be in contravention of the Act and regulations. The introduction of jurisdictional tobacco stamp will also mitigate risk related to smuggling. These changes also simplify the administration and auditing of tobacco clocks tobacco tax collection processes by reducing the number of transactions, streamlining the reporting, removing the need for inventory reconciliation, and ensuring that all <clears throat> inventories of tobacco products held by wholesalers are tax paid. And as wholesalers and retailers will no longer be collecting tobacco taxes on behalf of government, commissions will be eliminating and resulting in an annual savings of approximately $200,000. That concludes my opening comments. Uh, Mr. Chair, if the committee agrees, our panel is available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, committee, do you have any questions uh, for the minister or his staff at this time uh, about Bill 15? Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this, uh, we're looking at using the Manitoba stamp. What are the costs associated with developing uh, our own stamp? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Cooey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've approached all the, the major manufacturers to see about the viability of uh, them developing a Northwest Territory stamp. Um, they've all said that uh, we're too small of a jurisdiction um, to make that viable, so none of the major manufacturers will entertain that. Um, PEI is also a small jurisdiction and uh, they're in the same boat where they're just too small for the manufacturers to, to make their own stamp. So they, they have an agreement with Nova Scotia to use their stamp. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Simpson. Thank you for that answer. So we just have, don't have the ability, we already do not have the ability to, have, to make our own stamp, is that what you're saying? Or is it, 
it's not cost prohibitive for us. It's cost prohibitive for other entities. Are there numbers that attached to this? I just want to get some uh, some specifics, if you don't mind. Thank you. Mr. Cooley? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We, we've never got into the cost because just no manufacturer will develop a Northwest Territory stamp, um, so we just don't have that option. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooley. Anything further for the minister? All right. Um, hearing uh, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I guess I just want to try to understand how this uh, system is going to work uh, with these changes. Um, any tobacco products that are brought into the Northwest Territories um, are going to have to come from Manitoba, or they will have uh, a Manitoba stamp is going to be put on here in the Northwest Territories. How is this system actually going to work? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so right now our retailers purchase from um, licensed wholesalers. So under the legislation, you need to be a licensed wholesaler. Um, so there's currently 11 active wholesalers. Um, they're pretty much across Canada that, uh, that do issue tobacco to them. So when, when, uh, when a wholesaler places the order from a manufacturer, it's uh, destined for which jurisdiction it would be going to. So when the manufacturer sells it to the wholesaler, um, it is marked Alberta, Manitoba, whichever stamp. Um, currently, the Northwest Territories does not have its stamp, so it's marked with the what we call the black black stock tobacco. Um, so basically, whenever a wholesaler places an order, which then goes on to the retailers, the manufacturer packages it accordingly for whichever jurisdiction it is going to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to answer Mr. O'Reilly or to add to Mr. Um, Cooey's comments, uh, Mr. O'Reilly's question was, do we have to buy from Manitoba? No, we don't. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, I think I'm starting to understand this a little bit better. So um, the, the taxes then uh, are remitted by the wholesaler directly to Manitoba. Manitoba... Uh, accounts for that somehow, and then they're remitted back to us, or how does this system work? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. No, the taxes would be remitted to the GOWT directly. We're just using the Manitoba stamp. That would be affixed to it. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, the, the actual taxes then that are paid are uh, what Manitoba charges or what we charge or uh, and, and how does this handle from sort of an accounting perspective? Taxes are directly remitted to us uh, at the time of sale by, uh, from the manufacturers to the wholesalers that then send the, the product to the Northwest Territories. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So under the, under the current system, as, as it is today, under the current legislation, um, we kind of use the, the sales method of tax collection. So a wholesaler will place an order from a manufacturer. Um, no tax is paid at that time. The, uh, the wholesaler will then sell the product to the retailer and collect the tax from the retailer and then remit that to the government. Um, under the proposed method that this legislative amendment, if approved, we would move to what is called the, the purchase method, um, where when the wholesaler purchases it from the manufacturer, they will remit the tax owing on that directly to the government and then charge the retail accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just one point, just that was specific in your question, the tax rates would be the NWT tax rate, so we would continue to set our own tobacco tax rates. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So so what's in this for Manitoba? The, the, we're using their stamp. Um, do they, what sort of uh, control, if any, do they have over our tax rates or, um, uh, you know, and what, what is in this for uh, Manitoba? Do we have to remit a portion to Manitoba or something? Is there an administrative charge that they uh, they get or something? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Minister McLeod. 
We haven't negotiated the arrangement yet, but we're not anticipating that there will be anything in it for Manitoba. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. Rao? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just have to mull the, that over for a minute, but uh, thanks. Mr. Simpson? Thank you. There, there must have been some talks, I'd imagine, with Manitoba. Uh, and has there been any, any indication that, uh, that they might want to cut of this? And are you aware of how it works with, you said PEI and I think Nova Scotia share the same stamp. So is there some sort of uh, revenue sharing in that agreement that you're aware of? Thank you. Mr. Cooey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have had, uh, we have had talks with Manitoba already. Um, their only requirement is that we have the same tax collection point as them. Um, so moving to the purchase method as opposed to the sales method. That's their only requirement to date. So we do have a political commitment to enter into a, what we would have to enter into in, with Manitoba is just a, a MOU, uh, a, just a, a, uh, an agreement. Um, so we are using the simple, or as our first draft is the agreement between Nova Scotia and PI, um, which does not speak to any, any kind of revenue sharing. It's basically just a jurisdictional, jurisdictional thing to, to uh, use the stamp. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly fairly simple agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Mr. Simpson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, how much money does the government expect to, uh, to generate or, I guess, save from lost taxes uh, with, this, with this change to the Tax Act? How much are we looking at bringing into the tax system once this is implemented? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Curry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just a, a change to use the stamp and get better. I think it's more about a better control over over potential contraband. Um, this will facilitate a lot of um, easier easier to track the movement of product from a manufacturer to the Northwest Territories and throughout the system. Um, it's just about easier auditing. There's, there'll be less transactions on the tax paid when it's paid paid up front by a wholesaler. Um, so we're not anticipating um, any, any increased revenue. We do believe that the current system is working, but this would bring obviously stronger controls and easier to audit uh, throughout the entire system and um, you know, clarify when, if there is contraband coming into our system. This would allow us to allow us to, to catch that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I commend the department for taking this amendment initiative here on a proactive <coughs> collection basis here rather than our tax money sitting at uh, the retail shelf. It will be uh, submitted on, on wholesale, so i just point that out there. I'd rather see immediate cash flow than when it's sold, when it's sold. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Um, take that as a comment, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. So getting back to my previous question, so the GNWT believes there's no lost tax revenue to contraband product. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. <coughs> Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So we collect around $15.6 million worth of tobacco tax a year. Um, do I believe that there are people that do purchase cigarettes elsewhere and bring them into the territories? So, you know, undoubtedly that happens. Um, we've done studies as well as an uh, internal audit looked at the issue of, of you know, broader based contraband coming into the territory. Um, it's very difficult to estimate that exactly in terms of just using things like broader consumption rates and, and smoking rates and those sorts of things, but there's been no evidence found that there is widespread. We've also uh, um, smuggling in of cigarettes. We've also checked with the RCMP to see if they've um, have any issues associated with that, and they're not seeing anything that would lead us to believe that there's there's widespread spread, uh, smuggling activity as, as well. So we don't think that there'll be there is widespread uh, smuggling. This will, as uh, Mr. Cooey pointed out, help us with that monitoring and, and certainly will lessen the reporting burden that's out there. Um, but it's, we don't see it as a huge problem right now. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Uh, how, so the, the difference is that uh, the, I guess the wholesalers are going to be paying taxes up front. Uh, is this going to affect uh, wholesalers in the territory? And because instead of, I guess, collecting taxes incrementally as the product is sold, now they're going to be paying up front for, 
an entire entire shipment, I guess. So are there are there wholesalers in the territory, and uh, how will this affect them? Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, I think you're, you're, you've understood what the, the difference is. is. In the past, when uh, the old system, the wholesaler collected from retail, retailers as they made orders. Now the wholesaler will be paying it when they get it from the manufacturer. There are probably some impacts in terms of cash flow because they obviously will have that product and then sell it off to the retailers. My guess is, is and this is, is purely speculation, is that wholesalers probably don't keep a ton of inventory. Um, so I don't think that the, the cash flow issues are going to be substantive, but there certainly is an impact that they're paying it up front and then, then selling off the product to, uh, to the, the retailers. At the same time of that, though, there is much less burdensome in terms of reporting and, and collecting those taxes from those retailers that, that were in place under the old system. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. You said the government's assumption is that wholesalers do not keep a ton of inventory. Is that, uh, is that from discussions with industry, or is that just uh, – where did you get that idea from? Thank you. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think that's just uh, mostly from practice of, of talking with wholesalers generally, not specific to the tobacco industry, but just looking at business practices generally is when wholesalers tend to order product is when they, they have product to sell. So. And we certainly did a consultation with the, the wholesalers, and I don't think that was raised as an issue that, that uh, was of concern to the wholesalers that we deal with on the tobacco products. Mr. Simpson? Mr. McMahon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, getting back to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Simpson's uh, um, comment and question, I wonder, um, for myself and Mr. McNeely's uh, regions where they're furthest in the north, and sometimes we have shipments once a year, I wonder what kind of impacts this will have for, say, three of my communities. Um, they ship them in by barge, and that's once a year. And it, and what's going to have for the cost of, of, of food and other and other services in the, in the region? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Nak Mayak. <clears throat> Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, it is a tobacco tax, so I don't see that it would have impact on the, the food costs uh, in the region. Um, and the same tax is being collected from, or the same rates are being applied to tobacco, so um, I don't think it, it would impact the consumer at that end either in terms of even the tobacco products themselves. So um, unless I'm missing the, the, the question, I don't think it would have major impact on consumers for food products, et cetera. So, thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Nakamai. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question earlier was uh, uh, some communities, they'll ship in tobacco or, or dry goods once a year. And for some communities, that may mean a lot of tobacco. And I'm just wondering if that would have a ripple effect on other, on, on, on food and other things like that, where some companies um, uh, may not have the overhead as like the Northwest company who doesn't really matter whether they bring the price up or not. Um, I know it may affect some some small companies in, in, in my region who uh, own small um, small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. McLeod. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, I don't think it's going to have an impact on, on food or anything like that, or even the shipment, because the the retail company, say the Northwest Trading Company, would buy the product from the wholesaler who's already paid the tax on it, and it would be shipped like they normally ship it as they need it. So I don't think it will have a major impact if they bring in, if they brought in product before on the barge um, to retail in the community. They will continue to do that if they brought it in by plane to, to retail in the community. They would continue to do that. So I don't think it's going to have an effect at all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just want to go back to this issue of uh, potential impacts on wholesalers. How many wholesalers are there in the Northwest Territories? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Minister McLeod. There's one operating in the Northwest Territories. Uh, Mr. O'Reilly. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. So were there specific consultations held with the one wholesaler here in the Northwest Territories? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Minister McLeod? Yes. Mr. Riley? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to this issue of a, a stamp and so on. Um, it, I guess there was some previous communications with the government of Manitoba over using their stamp, but uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to have an arrangement in place uh, before the legislation is passed? Uh, if we don't have an arrangement in place, what if they they, they have a different government and perhaps now? Uh, will they change their mind? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. McLeod. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, we have a political uh, letter from the government of Manitoba that they are um, on board with this, and that's the reason we'll proceed. If we had made an agreement I, with them before coming to com before coming to committee with uh, with the legislation, then I'm sure we'd hear about that too. But we have a political commitment from the government of Manitoba. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. O'Reilly. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, I'm still trying to understand um, why we can't use our own stamp. Um, is this like it's too much to print, uh, design it, uh, our uh, manufacturers don't want to do it because the the, uh, the amount of product is, is too small? Um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to understand what the resistance is to having a, a, a different stamp for the Northwest Territories. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, if the manufacturer had agreed that we could have our own stamp, then we would have our own stamp. But they, I think we've said before, they just said we're too small of a jurisdiction. And um, they've said that to PEI. That's why PEI is uh, partnering up with Nova Scotia, and we are partnering up with, uh, with Manitoba. So the manufacturer said we're just too small. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Mr. Riley? Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, um, why would we go with Manitoba instead of Alberta, where, where most of the, the, the stuff is probably brought up from? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Riley. Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think we talked to a few jurisdictions at, at, when we were looking at this. One of the things you would want to do, and, and certainly Alberta would be an example of that, um, if you're too close to the, the province where you're using their stamp, the ability to go purchase there and bring in product that's purchased fr from Alberta, as an example, would be much greater than it would be for, for a, a further away jurisdiction. Obviously, PEI was okay with that because they, they went right next door. Um, I think we wanted to have a little bit of distance, and Manitoba was, was willing, and, and so that's why we ended up with Manitoba. But I'm not sure you'd necessarily want to be right next door in the jurisdiction unless that was, that was what was the uh, only option that would be available. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Mr. Stewart. Minister McLeod. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Manitoba's uh, tax rate is comparable to, to ours. I think we're, um, after April 1st, we're number one in the country again. And Manitoba is number two. And number two. Number three. Number three? Okay. We dropped them to number three. Uh, our, yeah, the committee noted that, actually, in, in our initial review of this, that uh, we'll, the NWT will have to maintain its tax similarly to, to Manitoba's to dis, uh, disincentivize, disincentivize smuggling. Um, if there's too wide a, a tax ratio, it would encourage it. So uh, we have reviewed that issue. Uh, Mr. Riley, anything further? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, yeah, I'm just trying to absorb the last little bit there because uh, I think I heard earlier that uh, um, I asked what was in it for Manitoba, whether our tax system had to be comparable in any way. And I thought the answer was no, uh, and now I'm hearing something different. So uh, um, maybe I could just uh, get some clarification on that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. There's no requirement for us to have the exact same, but I think the chair noticed that noted this as well. If you had a great um, variation between the tax rates charged, there's more incentive to go down and purchase in that jurisdiction. So the more similar the tax rates are, it, it lowers that incentive to maybe go and try to see if you could purchase cigarettes there. 
The other thing to remember, though, is while you want them similar, Manitoba also has a sales tax that we don't have, so that creates a difference as well. So I think while it's it's useful if the rates are similar, there's no requirement for them to be the same. It just does – it could potentially, if Manitoba for whatever reason decided to drop their tobacco tax to one cent when ours is around 30 cents or a little higher, that gap is, I think, what the chair was suggesting, would lower that incentive or maybe increase that incentive, I guess, to actually go to Manitoba to purchase. So there is a relationship, but there's no requirement. As it stands right now, their tobacco tax rate is very similar to ours, so that incentive to go to that other jurisdiction and purchase really doesn't – there is no incentive, particularly when you add on the sales tax on top of that. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Riley, conclude this line of questioning. Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. So I'd just like to clarify, is the GNWT's thought on this that this is going to be a revenue neutral change to the legislation? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. McLeod. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. We're saving $200,000. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. My other concern, will this have any negative effects for businesses in the Northwest Territories? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. McLeod. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. We don't think so. Thank you. There was some discussion around the – an evaluation of the current system of taxation and moving as it was prior to the implementation of this legislation. Have we ever done a comprehensive financial audit of the tobacco taxation? And apart from just looking at the statistical variances, and I believe the Deputy Minister mentioned some internal audit work, have we actually done a financial audit of the tax collections on tobacco tax? Mr. Cooey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Back in 2012, our internal audit bureau did a very formal review and a very comprehensive financial review of the tobacco tax just to ensure that, you know, again, we were collecting all the tax that was due to us. So, you know, through that audit, they did look at all the products from manufacturers to wholesalers. They did do significant financial audits on some retailers. You know, they did a lot of sampling of around the entire system just to ensure, and then comparing all that to the statistics around smoking and, you know, not only just smokers or routine smokers to average consumption a day. And they did a comprehensive review to ensure that the revenue we collected was in the neighborhood, and the review came back positive that we were in the neighborhood and we were not missing out on significant revenue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. McLeod, is the committee able to see the findings of that internal audit review? Mr. Minister? Just wait. Yeah, my understanding is that we've shared information with MLAs in the past, and if there's an opportunity here, we will share our findings with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Can you make that commitment to share that as we continue to review this piece of legislation? I just did. Okay. Thank you. That's the opportunity. All right. Anything further for the minister or his staff? Okay. Hearing nothing further from the committee, I will thank the minister and his staff for answering our questions for today. We're now a committee. We now have concluded this stage of the review. And, Minister, if you have any closing comments, you may make them now. No, I'm just thanking the committee for their time, as always, and I look forward to feedback from the committee as we move forward with this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And I'll ask for if there's anyone from the – after the minister clears the witness table, I'll ask if anyone from the general public would like to comment on Bill 15, an act to amend the Tobacco Tax Act. Thank you.
please introduce yourself uh, for the record. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Roger Walker, and uh, I'm uh, one of the owners of Northern Snack Foods uh, Limited here in Yellowknife, and we operate a division of Northern Snack Foods, which is Territorial Tobacco Products, and we are the we are the only resident licensed wholesale collector in the Northwest Territories. So, as I said, thank you uh, so much for this. Uh, we began uh, operations as the only resident uh, wholesale collector back in 2010, and uh, it soon soon became obvious to us that the GNWT was not collecting millions of dollars in tobacco taxes. And I made the GNWT aware of this situation in 2011. So included in my submission is a letter I wrote to Mr. Doug Doak in 19, or 19, I'm sorry, 2014, explaining back then why the amendments that are contemplated today in uh, Bill 15 would not accomplish the goals of the GNWT. So um, I know you've had uh, the opportunity to review that. And so I will try to clarify any questions that you may have regarding why the use of another province's stamp uh, will not work, in my opinion, and uh, should my submission not be clear. I also wish to clarify why having wholesalers pay the NWT tax at the time of purchase will only affect my operation. And again, if there are any questions arising from my submissions on that. Uh, once that's completed, I'd like to go over a uh, press conference from 2012 uh, that documented and uh, documents and further explains the loophole in the GNWT's collection system and how to remedy the situation. This press, press conference was done by former MLA Daryl Dolany uh, back in 2012, as I said. I've also provided a copy of a tax memo from Alberta. I'd like to make sure that all members understand how these tax memos work and why they, along with the actual audits of wholesalers, will solve the GNWT's tax collection problem. Again, thank you for allowing me to do this, and I'd like to take any questions uh, on, on my submission. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, other questions to Mr. Walker at this point? Mr. Simpson. Thank you. You say that there's uh, millions in unclaimed taxes not going to the GNWT. Uh, we had the minister here. They, they said there was – they said they, they were missing out on any, I guess, tax revenue, basically, is the impression I got. Um, how do you come to those, uh, those figures of uh, millions of dollars? Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Walker. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we will get into uh, with Mr. Dolany, um, I had a, uh, Mr. Dolany's uh, press conference. The numbers that he uses are taken are taken from Stats Canada. And although my personal belief is uh, that there's actually more tax missing than what Stats Canada numbers say, the numbers that Stats Canada puts forward is six to ten million dollars less in collections than what the GNWT is saying they are collecting. Um, as I said before, I'm, I'm quite sure, well I haven't said that yet, but I'm quite sure I know how this is happening and I would be more than happy to uh, walk you through it. So, thank you Mr. Chair. Mr. Simpson? Uh, the committee would like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd like to walk through it if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, if you could, uh, Mr. Walker, I think committee would uh, would appreciate hearing the. Uh, so, the as uh, as I said in my uh, submission, um, all of this uh, this gets down to uh, to tax memos. So when when a wholesaler purchases product, uh, uh, right now the. Uh, the vast uh, majority of product that's coming into the NWT uh, comes through Alberta. So when a wholesaler purchases product uh, for the NWT, 
it gets shipped for the most part to Alberta. And when it lands in Alberta, a tax memo is sent to the Alberta government uh, saying how much tobacco has been sent into the province and it is at the Alberta tax rate, which is today is approximately $10 less. It used to be $17 less than the NWT rate. However, so when the wholesaler, and I'm not mentioning any names uh, here, when a wholesaler could conceivably uh, send, I, in my uh, submission I used uh, just 100 cartons as, a, as an example. They will send 100 cartons into the Northwest Territory and charge the store that they're sending it to the full NWT tax rate. And then the store pays that tax rate. Then the wholesaler then sends only or reports to the government because this is self-reported. Reports to the government instead of 100 cartons, they have sent 50 cartons as an example. They've charged out the whole uh, 100 cartons at the NWT tax rate. They have had to pay the Alberta tax rate when they, when they uh, landed the product there from the manufacturer. They submit to the GNWT on their report that they have sold 50 cartons and they apply to the Alberta government to get their Alberta tax back on those same 50 cartons. In fact, they've sent 100 in and so the difference is they've charged uh, full NWT tax on all 100 and so then they pocket the difference between the NWT tax and the Alberta tax on the 50 cartons. And I have to, I have to uh, apologize. I, I'm way better at putting things down on paper than I am talking. <laughs> so I, I hope that kind of clarified that uh, a little bit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walker. You're doing fine. Um, <laughs> I know it's uh, your, uh, your first time appearing before yes. uh, a committee of this nature. So uh, thank, thank you. you. And we are very patient. Uh, Mr. Simpson? Thank you. That was very clear, actually. So it sounds like this is uh, your alleging criminal activity. Has there been any uh, criminal investigations by RCMP or, uh, or anyone on this on this matter? No. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Walker. <laughs> just wait to, until you're acknowledged by the chair. Mr. Walker, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, there hasn't been. As I said, I uh, brought this to the attention of the GNWT back in 2011, and uh, they had the Internal Audit Bureau look into it. And the uh, Internal Audit Bureau, I am told, uh, spent 600 hours looking into, into this. And uh, unfortunately, even by, uh, uh, in my response from the minister, there were no audits done. There were no audits done. This, what was done here was a reconciliation. And as long as uh, the tax memo don't flow, that's the only way and without audits that they could ever, ever find this out because the Alberta tax is paid, the GNWT tax is paid, and so when they look at the amounts that are shipped in and the amounts that they've collected, they're sure to match because it's self-reported. So, and I'll get into this later, but the way to uh, way to curb that is to have all of the uh, tobacco landed from the manufacturers into the, GN, into the NWT because that triggers a tax memo, an NWT tax memo, and then the NW, or GNWT knows exactly how much tobacco is coming in and how much tax that they can expect from this. And uh, if there are no audits, I'm sorry, if there's no audits uh, performed on any other wholesalers, then what's happening today isn't going to stop. Anyway, I'm 
I'm sorry, I rambled on there a little. Sorry, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Simpson? Thank you. So your understanding of the bill, the, the proposed amendments, is that uh, tobacco will not be landed in the NWT and the GNWT will not be directly informed of the tobacco that is uh, purchased by the wholesalers for distribution in the territory. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Walker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, right now the only the only uh, tax memos that flow to the GNWT is for the uh, tobacco that we purchase from the manufacturers because the manufacturers land it here at our facility. And as I said, that triggers the, an NWT tax memo. Uh, all the other southern uh, wholesalers, the tax memo goes to the province where the product is taken possession of or landed. And uh, as I said, most of it is Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, I see you've provided this committee with um, an example of one of those tax memos. Yes. And just, uh, just a moment, Mr. Walker. And in the uh, upper right-hand corner, there's a province of tax, and this memo is indicating Alberta. Is that along the lines of what you're saying about the product landing and being taxed where it lands, Mr. Walker? Mr. Chair, yes, that's exactly right. Uh, this this uh, particular one, as an example, uh, this uh, the 51,200 cigarettes and 30,000 fine cut there was landed in in Alberta, and the $19,240 is that's the tax rate. The, uh, that's the, the amount of tax that that tobacco attracts, and it's done at the Alberta tax rate because that's where they took possession of the product. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Uh, Mr. Simpson, did you further? Uh, this is something I might have to clarify later, but I thought when the department was up here, they said the wholesalers will pay upon purchase from the manufacturer directly to the GNWT, so we'd be bypassing this, this system. Um, so that, I guess that's something uh, somebody's going to have to get clarification on from the department. Uh, uh, I'll turn it forward to someone else for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I uh, had asked um, the minister and his staff what sort of uh, direct consultation, well, I asked how many wholesalers there were here in the Northwest Territories and whether there had been direct consultation with the uh, wholesalers here. Uh, presumably, you're the only wholesaler. And uh, uh, what was your view of the uh, consultation around these changes? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Ms. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, the, well, the only consultation that I had on, on these amendments was uh, in 2014. Uh, there was uh, a letter from uh, Mr. Doak at that time uh, looking for uh, parties that are, could be affected or would be affected by these amendments then to make a submission. And that's the letter that I, uh, I have provided to the committee here. Um, since then, uh, no, I wasn't cons consulted when this was, was done. I, actually, I found out that it was, uh, that it was happening uh, just uh, after we had already passed second reading. So. Thank you, Mr. Thank Walker. You. Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks. Uh, that's all I need to hear. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I agree with my two previous colleagues here, uh, Mr. Walker. And I'm just trying to get an understanding as, as well as what uh, Mr. Simpson had mentioned earlier here trying to keep track of the flow of the cart and where it goes and so on and your sample of the uh, <clears throat> of the ticket here and taking into account what the minister and his staff were saying earlier and my understanding you're the only wholesaler in town or in the NWT so that would create a, a monopoly for you should everything go the way I think you would like to see it go, so accountability. I don't have an issue with that. It's it's business. Anybody else could apply for a wholesale license. But just tracking the whole system, I, I would say, is 
is I, I'm trying to grasp or find out how it can be in listening to the minister rather than collecting the tax once the carton is sold from the shop, the store downtown. That's when we get our taxes. I would rather see the tax come upon purchase from the manufacturer as per the sample here rather than somebody sitting on capital which they can immediately get from wholesale arrangements. So I, I'm, I'm, I guess I, I got no question. I'm just trying to get an un, a better understanding. I, I'm listening to you and I'm understanding as well. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Walker. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, because this gets back to the kind of the second part of of this um, this amendment in in my mind. Uh, right now, we. Uh, we are the only wholesaler that has to carry inventory, and uh, all the southern invent all the southern wholesalers, they they know how much product uh, is, they're going to need to satisfy their stores, and uh, so they can order it, but it doesn't become NWT stock until it gets sold. And so Southern wholesalers, even if they use the Manitoba stamp, aren't going to be required to pay the NWT tax until they sell it in. My company, and uh, we're a small wholesaler, right? The tax, tax amounts are huge, as you know. And depending on the day, we carry anywhere from about 350 to 500 thousand dollars worth of tax in inventory. But if this amendment goes through, and I have to come up with that money, I have to come up with up to half a million dollars, plus about half of last month's, because currently the wholesalers don't have to pay the tax for. 20 days, sorry. And so, if this amendment goes through as it is, I'm going to have to come up with about somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 or 750 thousand dollars. And the return, this is a very small margin business, and uh, the returns, uh, it's just no, it's it's no use me even doing this. I, uh, and again, we're the only ones that this will affect. Should this should this happen? Because we're the only ones that have to carry NWT stock inventory. I hope that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. McNeely. Yeah, I think just to uh, clarify and avoid confusion, let's just do away with the uh, for discussion purposes. Do away with the Manitoba stamp. The stamp just confirms duty paid. Correct? Mr. Walker? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, yes, it would. Um, whoever, uh, whichever wholesaler purchases it, purchases it. And yes, they would, uh, they would be uh, paying the manufacturer for the product. They still have to pay the GNWT, the GNWT's tax. And as long as there are no audits on uh, these wholesalers that uh, are abusing the system, that portion isn't going to change. Thank you. Mr. McGeary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so I, I would say probably the real dilemma or the real problem would be uh, because it's self-regulating, and you use an example of shipping 100 cartons and only accounting for 50. So I, I guess that's probably where the, the gap is that we're trying to get true sales on taxable income. Correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Walker? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's, exact, that's exactly right. And uh, that's why, uh, getting back to the tax memos, if, this, if all the tobacco was landed, in the NWT, 
from the manufacturers. That tax memo goes directly to the GNWT, so you know exactly how much is coming in here and how much tax NWT rate is expected from that. You have to, they have to provide audits on these other wholesalers to close that door, otherwise it will just continue to happen. Uh, even, <laughs> even other than uh, the stuff that uh, they're not landing here, it's just still going to keep coming in uh, exactly the way it's happening right now. The, uh, if the GNWT did uh, land everything here, and you're absolutely right, we are the only licensed wholesaler. And I guess if you look at it that way, it, uh, it would create a monopoly, but I look at it uh, a little bit uh, like, the, the, uh, like the liquor board. The GNWT says how much uh, they can sell it for. They regulate that, or at least they used to, right? And uh, so that would be the same thing with us as the resident wholesaler. That way your tax memos flow and uh, we would agree on the compensation to us for doing this. And uh, uh, I mean, contrary to maybe popular, <laughs> popular belief, there's not a lot of money in the wholesale of tobacco if you're following the rules properly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, I'm going to move to Mr. Simpson now. Uh, thank you. So uh, just to be clear on this, I asked the department, uh, is this going to have any negative effects for NWT businesses? And they said no. But now you're saying that you're going to have to keep three quarters of a million dollars of basically working capital up front uh, in order to, to, to make a purchase. And that kind of sounds like a, a negative effect for an NWT business. Um, so, and I guess that just goes to, uh, to Mr. O'Reilly's point about the consultation. Uh, did you sit down with the department and have this discussion, basically, that, that you're having with the committee right now? Do they, did they know all this? Or did, or I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Mr. Walker? Mr. Chair, uh, no. Uh, as I said, I responded to uh, a request from, uh, from uh, the fine, I believe it was finance, from Mr. Doak in 2014. And uh, that was the... That was the extent of it. I, so. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Simpson? I guess that's where we come in. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Simpson. Now, uh, just for clarification, Mr. Walker, you did uh, bring this issue to the attention of the, the government in 20, uh, 2012, 2011, around that time, and there was a, an audit done. We did hear that evidence from the ministers uh, before you presented. Um, perhaps you could just speak to that briefly. Uh, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, in, uh, because uh, I became aware that, uh, that uh, the GNWT was not collecting uh, uh, millions of dollars in tax, I, d I, approached, I approached the uh, GNWT and uh, they uh, had a look at uh, my allegations and they had the internal audit bureau come out and uh, we went over what uh, what uh, my concerns were if you will and uh, how I thought um, this this was happening and they did their their work however as I said and even uh, from a uh, uh, prior uh, letter from the minister which I can provide to you after uh, it wasn't an audit. It was a reconciliation, and really, and uh, so they, there was, yeah, there was lots of work done. But when, at the end of the day, if it's self-reported that this much was moved into the territories, and they say, well, yeah, we moved this much in, we paid you this much, they're bound to match. So without audits, it, actual audits. And uh, it, it just won't work. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Walker. My actual audit, you mean an independent, an independent from government audit? Um, 
Is that well, uh, more or less what you're speaking of? Well, yeah, yes or no. The, uh, yes or no. <laughs> Actual audits. The, the GMWT audited my operation. Uh, I don't recall what year it was. It was uh, within a year or two after, after I brought this forward. And it took them two weeks to audit uh, my small little operation. So uh, to actually audit a, uh, a Northwest company or a Wallace and Carey or a federated co-op, I don't know how long it would take them. And I think the costs, and I'm, that's just my personal opinion, the costs of doing that, even though they should be done on a regular basis, I think the costs of doing that uh, are not that they're prohibitive, but uh, they just believe that uh, it's going to cost too much. And so it, it's, I don't believe it's ever been done. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walker. And uh, just noting the time, we've almost um, uh, ex uh, we're, we're close to exceeding uh, where we're at with this portion of our, our hearing today. But I do want to allow Mr. Riley to ask his questions, and then we will uh, wrap up this portion of the public hearing. Mr. Riley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I'm just trying to understand what the real solution is here. Then um, we need to have uh, these uh, tax me tax memo. We need to have our own stamp then. Uh, um, uh, and the, it, so that uh, when the, the product is uh, brought into the Northwest Territories, um, it's, uh, the taxes are paid directly by the manufacturers. Uh, is that what we really need? And I can understand how it would work here in, in Yellowknife in this part of the Northwest Territories, but how would it work in a place like Inuvik where clearly they probably get stuff through Whitehorse? So. Uh, any sort of thoughts on what the real solution is here to help us through this? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Walker? Uh, yes, uh, well, two parts to that. Um, the uh, uh, All three territories, uh, Nunavut, uh, Yukon, and the Northwest Territories currently use black stock, and that's because the population base is so small. And so, uh, I mean, they were correct. The manufacturers uh, really do not want to. Uh, do a, a, an NWT specific stamp that would go a long ways, but however, uh, I just don't believe that's going to happen. So, the tax memo system, if it's supplied properly, will will work. We uh, we send product to Anuvik to customers right now. We all all across the territories, uh, you know, they're smaller customers. But uh, so we can ship it uh, uh, to anywhere in the NWT. And, uh, so it can, it certainly can work. Again, as I said, the tax memo uh, system will work uh, for you because it allows tracking uh, of and some control over the, the tobacco coming in here. And uh, to the to the point uh, uh, to your point that it would cause a a monopoly as I said uh, that is easily controlled I mean I, I couldn't just go and start charging X because if that happened it could be worked through the government that uh, very much like the liquor store system and then you and then you have control back right now you have no control Thank you, Mr. Walker. Okay. Well, that uh, that brings us uh, to the end of our uh, witness testimony. But I'd like to thank uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Walker, and for uh, providing your expertise on this issue. And I'll allow you to have a, a brief summation of, of your testimony uh, today. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and I will try to be brief. I, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we didn't get to uh, Mr. Dolany's press conference, but uh, uh, thing. But I would really like, uh, if because uh, it is a public document, if you could uh, have a look at that, because it further explains this loophole and how this thing should be uh, uh, should be looked after. I do uh, strongly believe that uh, these amendments, if they're passed as they are, uh, can 
can potentially shut my business down and uh, as the only resident wholesaler here today uh, I've been uh, I've been uh, watching watching uh, for these tax collection problems and reporting them whenever I can and if I'm not here that's not going to happen anymore however um, I don't believe the uh, the uh, stamp will will work uh, because without audits nothing is going to change from what's happening now and because the uh, GNWT is collecting the uh, less than even what Stats Canada says they should be collecting. They're short six to ten million dollars a year and so that has to be addressed. I've been trying to get this thing addressed since 2011. So, Thank you very much Mr. Chair. Thank you Mr. Walker and uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, seeing no further public submissions on Bill 15, does committee agree to schedule a clause by clause review of uh, the bill at a later date? Thank you, committee. Uh, and with that, we will uh, we're we're done with Bill 15, and we will move on to our public review of uh, Bill 17. Thank you, Mr. Walker.